During my recent vacation, I read, amongst other things, Rose McGowan's 2018 memoir, Brave. As I, in general, really enjoy reading this type of literature, I got through the book fairly quickly. The beginning was kind of slow, with certain moments even seeming altered for the book to make it a little more woke-sounding. Like Rose saying that her dad called her a feminazi when she was about 14, so in the year 1987, whereas the term, from what I could find online, started to be used and was popularized in the early 90s by Rush Limbaugh, or a little earlier in the book, where she, as a child that grew up in Europe, isolated from the rest of the society by living in a cult, allegedly was pissed off whenever her stepdad would use the n-word, which just does not seem believable given the circumstances. But the latter part of the book, when Rose starts describing all of the horrors of Hollywood she endured, and she knew of, is a page-turner. I got through the last 150 to 200 pages, I think in like a day. While I do not think that Rose's brand of feminism is for everyone, or is completely applicable to the entire world, I think it's a good starting point that we can build off of. What's important for this video is this next section of the book, where she wrote, In 2016, only 23% of speaking roles on screen were women, the majority in horror films, and we all know how they get treated. If you don't think this is a big deal, you are wrong. It is a very big deal. This is how we form our notions about ourselves and others, and it poisons us in ways we are not always cognizant of. The latter part of the quote that I just read did make me think about doing a video on how Drag Race portrays any other race or ethnicity, other than black or white, and how undervalued people of Asian descent are, whichever part of the Asian continent they may have come from, how vilified Slavic cultures have been, and how lumped together with Soviet Union we are. Also, I just wanted to show you this too. While editing this video, I was watching one of the new episodes of Uh? This bit of translation error on the editor's part made me genuinely laugh. So, as you can see, there's the flag in the bag because haha, ha, Cold War, the Soviet Union flag, US people really need new jokes and references at this point. And in the top right corner of the screen, you have that little graphic that's supposed to signify that the mock news broadcast is happening live. So whoever edited this part literally just typed L-I-V-E into Google Translate or whatever other online translator and probably copied whatever first word came up. The verb to live. Not the adjective live, but to live. And lastly, how Hispanic queens who are tied strongly to their Hispanic roots are absolutely never allowed to thrive on the show. Although I have made a video about that already, but no. The quote made me wonder, for a show that allegedly celebrates femininity in women, and that is, again, allegedly very progressive in that matter, how much of the show is actually run by women? What Rose said applies only to the people we see on screen, with her saying that in 2016, just below a quarter of all speaking roles in film were for women. If we took a look at this for Drag Race, we'd get an even smaller percentage, given that the majority of the contestants are men. The main judges are also mostly men. You might say that this is obvious, they're drag queens, men dressing up as women or whatnot, but that erases a pretty solid percentage of queens that are women, cis or trans, and non-binary queens. Furthermore, drag kings also exist, and if we apply the same flawed logic, most of them should be women dressing up as men. But even though the show in its name and the title that the winner gets does not specify if it's a drag queen or a drag king, we have not seen a drag king on the show's main franchise. And we have had, like, what, 19 seasons so far? With Kylie Sonique Love being to my knowledge, the first woman to have been crowned on the show, whatever portion of her win you believe may be attributed to her being trans and to RuPaul covering his past transphobic comments, or simply showing that he has changed, this is an important moment for the show. This got me thinking. If we don't see many women on screen, how many of them work behind the cameras?
I began the search by going over the credits of the last aired episode of the US franchise, the finale of All Star 6. Based on the names, obviously, I wrote down all of the women that were mentioned in the credits and then calculated what percentage of the show's crew is women. I am very well aware that this is a somewhat flawed process, as we don't know if the people that I'm about to mention maybe identify themselves as non-binary, so if that is the case and I get it wrong, I want to apologize in advance. Let's go full screen with a screenshot so you can fully see the names I'm about to read, and I possibly might mispronounce some. Now, if you're not interested to hear the names of the women that helped make the finale of All Star 6 happen, you can skip to this timestamp of the video. On the first slide of the credits, we have Michelle Visage, pulling double duty as a judge and as one of the producers. Anna Mulezon Moore, I think, I'm not sure, the associate director, Natalia James and Andrea Van Meter, Meter, I don't know, the supervising producers, then Alicia Gargaro Mangana, I'm assuming it's Spanish, one of the producers, Delaney Jaeger, one of the consulting producers, and Katie Espejo, a segment producer. Next, Ashley Dabney and Thea Burns, field producers, Melissa Perez, the associate producer, and Alexis Koble, the production supervisor. On the third slide, we have only one woman, Kristen Kabznel. Kabznel? Kabznel? I'm not sure. Next, I want to say Jana Costa, maybe? The art director. Alison Spain, the assistant art director. And Kristen Rasmussen, the lead person. Okay, well done, Drag Race, on using the neutral title. That still has not reached popular use, as the term lead man is still majorly used. But hey, that's how changes in language happen. Bit by bit, one community at a time. On the next slide, we have... Ori Friedrich, one of the set dressers, Zara Busey, maybe? Ooh, I don't think I got that right. And Nassim Peterson, who are the show's scenics, and the show's makeup artists, Jan Fregoso and Nicole Faulkner. On the next slide, we have a lot of women to go over. Amongst the editors, there are... Ooh, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce her last name, because I think it's French and it's not one of my strongest suits, so I'm just going to say Mary. Catherine Griffin, Francie Kachler, and Laurel Ostrander. Two of the show's three story producers are Jessica Brown and Chelsea Holman, while among the talent handlers we have Kalian Amarb... I don't know, I looked her up, she's of Bulgarian descent, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name. Carla Ford, Vanessa Gonzalez, Elizabeth Jerome, Catherine Lazaritz, that's a cool name, and Sarah Reeves. Lastly, the show's assistant talent managers are all women. Brittany Bretzman, Maria Cuadro Pradesava, or something like that, Jules Roche, maybe? And Christy Verka? Ooh, I just took a really strong L with these. On the next slide, we have Cristina Chavez, the talent production assistant, while Goloka Bolti does the casting. That's another cool name. Vanessa Hilton and Tiffany Morell are the show's COVID compliance officers. Yes, that has to exist now. Next, the show's transcribers include three women, Alison Dean, Katrina Camp, and Kathleen Flannery. But there are also three women that are production assistants. Victoria Himes, Imani Martin, and Antrice Nelson, another cool name. Next, let's not look at the, uh, you know, non-people mentioned in the credits, and let's highlight Maggie Tilker and Jennifer Park. We're nearing the end with Michelle Palmer, the Senior VP of Human Resources, Amber Ellis, who's the executive in charge of production, Mona Card, who's the head of rights and clearances, and Taylor Craig, who's the line producer. Lastly, the show's supervising producer is a woman, Jan Passavoy, I guess, while the executive producer is a man. If I counted everything correctly, we're looking at a crew of 149 people, excluding companies that helped work on the show, and excluding the time someone has more than one job on the show. Out of those 149 people, 53 are women. That's around 35.57% of the crew, so just a tiny little bit over a third. Okay, not the greatest of outcomes, but maybe this stat is not the fairest to look at, as we were looking at a season that was affected by COVID. Let's go back in time to the last season completely unaffected by COVID, season 11. 
We could have also done All-Stars 4, but since I have now first taken a look at an All-Star season, let's change to a regular. Just to refresh your memory, since that season we have had seasons 12 and 13, All-Stars 5 and All-Stars 6, Drag Race UK seasons 2 and now upcoming 3, and Drag Race Down Under. So excluding the spin-offs without RuPaul, we have had 7 seasons and counting affected by COVID. Back to the topic of the video. I went through the credits of the premiere episode of season 11 with the same idea as before and counted that for that episode, excluding the companies and people that were credited more than once, the crew consisted of 146 people where 48 of them were women. Yeah, again, we're floating around that one third fraction. I didn't count the queens that returned in the mini challenge, but it's worth mentioning that Kylie Sonique was one of them. Also, here I did not count the pit crew, as the whole point of them is to parody the pretty girl that says nothing and is just there as eye candy in a game show, a la Wheel of Fortune or Deal or No Deal. It's like being progressive, but not really. For the sake of comparing with the original material that inspired me to make this video, let's look at a season of Drag Race that was filmed in 2016. Season 9. Here I will look at the category is episode, aka the top 4 episode, the last episode filmed in 2016. For some reason on WoW Plus the episode does not end with the credits, and the little credits that we see in the beginning of the episode do not give enough information, so I went to IMDb. Their list of credits is not as detailed as the previous two lists of credits from the ends of the two episodes that we talked about, given that 64 different names are listed. Here I excluded the top four and the dancers, even though only one dancer's name is listed there. So out of the 64 names, I counted only 18 women, or 28.125% of the crew, below the one-third fraction we've been floating around, but still a tad bit better than the percentage Rose mentioned in Hollywood. So, from what I could see, on average, women represent one-third of the crew on Drag Race. This would be okay if we knew that the second third were men and the last third was reserved for non-binary people, but we know that's not the case. The majority of the jobs that women have on Drag Race have to do with art, as in set dressing, design, makeup, or they have more people-related jobs. These are all traditionally considered jobs for women. Not many, if any, women are camera operators, technicians, and such. Now, of course, someone might say that's to be expected, as there aren't as many women in that latter field or as there aren't as many men in the former field. That's fair, but flawed. Taking that logic into account, a season of Drag Race with, well, let's say, 10 queens that is cast in a way to racially represent the current population of the US would have something like 7 white queens, 2 black queens, and 1 Asian queen. Does that seem fair to you? Hopefully not. Obviously, the US population and the queens that audition for Drag Race are not comparable one to one, but casting based on the percentage of the race of the people auditioning also is not fair for the minorities. Drag Race, please have more women working on your show. Change comes from the bottom, and this video was not made to hate on the show, but to maybe possibly start a conversation, and of course hear what others think on the topic. I'm especially hoping to hear from the women that watch me, so please share your thoughts in the comments below, email me, or message me on Instagram. Thank you. I tend to get a lot of comments telling me that I complain a lot about the show. To that, I'm going to read the second part of the passage that I quoted at the beginning of the video, and respond by saying, All I can tell you is to watch what you consume. Start noticing the stereotypes and the cliches. Start rejecting them. Start complaining. Tweet at the directors, studios, whatever companies behind them. But most of all, demand more. Your mind is at stake.